So let's begin for one final time today. BC Ops, I'm going to start again now and run for an hour until 5 p.m. when we'll finish for the day. Thanks. All right. Um, so this picture shows that the ordinary regression seems like it's behaving reasonably. And as I said, a standard frequentist move right now would be to go ahead and throw out all the other variables except the complaints variable and go with that and see what that model looks like in terms of diagnostics. And so we could try that here ourselves. So I'll run the LM command again, this time with um, the model that says rating is um, modeled directly as a function only of complaints. The previous time I ran that model, it said rating is modeled as a function of dot, and dot is a notation, is an abbreviation inside the LM command, meaning put in all the variables. And so here uh, I just put in the variable complaints. So let's go ahead and run that. And you can see that um, it produces an adjusted R squared value that's similar to what we had before, uh, and um, it produces a uh, everything else, as far as the numbers are concerned, of course, are not directly comparable because we dropped all the other uh, variables out. But uh, the coefficient on complaints is loading more strongly than it did before, uh, but with a uh, and with a rather smaller standard error as well. So uh, now we can do the the um, uh, plotting of that one as well and see uh, if the the diagnostics seem reasonable for it as well. This is now the model where we have only rating modeled from complaints. The residuals versus the predicted values looks great. Plot, the normal QQ plot has some observations that are hanging around in the tails a little bigger than the, the Gaussian story would expect. Again, the scale location plot, which plots the square root of the standardized residuals against the fitted values, shows not very much tendency to have them either getting bigger or smaller as you get to bigger fitting values. And again, the lower right-hand picture I don't find useful. So that's a frequentist maximum likelihood analysis. Now let's look at the Bayesian model averaging approach. So first we have to install this package BMS from CRAN. Um, I've already done that here, so I don't have to install it. I'm, all I need to do is to load it, and you can do that either with the pull-down menu in R for loading something, or you can inside R you can use the library command. So I'm just going to bring it in with that. If you do, do this yourself, you're going to have to I'll get it from the web first. And it warns me, as usual, that it was built under a, a more recent version of R than the one I'm using, but that's OK. Um, and now I can run um, the Bayesian model averaging uh, command. And what it's going to do, the only part of the model that it's going to express uncertainty over is the subset of the predictors that is the best possible subset. In other words, it's going to condition on the Gaussian structure for the error terms. And it's going to condition on the fact that the Ys are being treated as normal rather than transforming them. It's not going to look for transformations of the Ys, transformations of the Xs. It's not going to change the norm, not going to think about the normality assumption. It's only going to try to propagate uncertainty over what is the best subset of the predictor variables. So that's one of the standard things that arises in this. It's not full Bayesian model averaging across all possible models because we'd want to we would want to query the the uh, outcome rather the, the error, error distribution as well. But let's go ahead and run it and see what we get. And um, it's actually, since there are six um, predictor variables it's choosing among, how many different possible subsets is it working with? Can you work that one out in your head? It's two to the sixth models minus one. But uh, it's going to fit the model with, uh, with none of them as well, the intercept term. So it's going to do two to the sixth models, uh, which is 64. And so um, that turns out to be instantaneous um, with the, with the uh, calculations it's making. Uh, for our purposes today, I'm going to treat how it does the calculations for the posterior model probabilities as a black box um, so that we can look at the implications of Bayesian model averaging rather than the details of how it's done. Um, and uh, with a much larger model space, instead of being able to do full enumeration across all the possibilities, it has to do some kind of stochastic search through the subset of, or the set of all subsets of the regressors. Yes? Yes, I can. So BMS is the function. And we're applying it to the data set called attitude. And we are choosing from among a variety of different possible priors. And I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, and um, 
we're using something called Zellner's G prior, and I'll say something more about that in a minute. And user int equals false simply turns off a variety of information that it could have told us, but it didn't. So now to see what's what's meant by that, let's go back to the course. <laughs> what's that? No, I haven't. No, no, I haven't. I haven't explained it yet. So now I'm about to explain it. Um, so to try to do better better job of explaining, let's go back to the course web page, and download this guy's um, uh, manual and look through what he says. So. That's correct. Um, so, that's correct. And so we have two different things floating around in here. We have the the, pus, the prior probabilities across the models, and the standard thing to do is uniform on that. Um, and uh, then we have to put priors on the parameters in the models. And a particular choice that uh, uh, a leading Bayesian econometrician named Arnold Zellner uh, favored uh, some years ago, and people are still using it, is called Zellner's G prior. And I won't go into the details of how it works unless people want me to. And really, then I'd rather do it offline rather than online in the class. But basically, let's get down to the example. So I'm just basically taking you through his tutorial example, the first one. He has a much bigger data set later on, but we're going to look at the smaller data set here. So, um, so M prior equals uniform means to assign a uniform model prior. G equals UIP is a particular version of Zellner's G prior that I recommend to you. It stands for what's called the unit information prior, and I'll explain what I mean by that next time. And uh, um, the last option, I, as, as he says, is just used to suppress user interactive output. Um, so now we can look at the coefficients and see what's going on, and we'll get immediately a table of interesting numbers to stare at. So, whoops. So let's go back to the course web page and back to the R code. Back to where we were in the R code. So having run this Bayesian model averaging story, let's ask it for the coefficients and then spend some time interpreting them. So the column called PIP, you'll notice there's only six rows here, one for each predictor variable. Uh, the column called PIP stands for posterior inclusion probability, and it represents the proportion, if you want to talk about it frequently, the proportion of time, if it were doing MCMC sampling across different models, the proportion of time that the variable complaints showed up in the models that were that were accepted. Um, and so these numbers are direct indications of how valuable any single predictor is to the overall prediction process. And the numbers match qualitatively what we saw before. The, um, the posterior inclusion probability for the complaints variable is essentially one. Uh, and the one for learning is a little is quite a bit smaller than that, but still non-zero. And then the advanced variable below that. Um, the uh, conditional positive sign uh, that's basically saying if the model if that parameter belongs in the model, then should it have a plus sign or a minus sign? And uh, when you get a 1.0, that means that if that that particular variable belongs in the model, then it should come in with a plus sign. And gee, there's no surprise to that because look, the posterior mean for that regression coefficient is about 0.7, give or take about 0.1. So it's definitely positive, right? Similarly, this one, um, if it's going to come in, um, uh, it should come in positively. And this is more interesting because um, its posterior mean is only about 0.1 with a posterior standard deviation of 0.15. And yet it still has uh, essentially a, a probability, posterior probability 1 of coming in with a plus sign. And this variable, these two variables here that come in with negative um, uh, posterior means, you can see that their conditional posterior probability of being plus signs is nearly zero. And the other ones are more equivocal. And it has reordered, the code has reordered the variables. They used to be in the data set numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now, in order of apparent importance, they're numbered 1, 3, 6, 2, 4, 5. All right, so that would be useful if you were just trying to do model selection by looking at only one variable at a time. And this would give the same answer that the frequentist approach did, namely, it looks like the variable that really matters is the complaints variable, so you might consider tossing the rest of them out. But that actually would not be a good idea because there's quite a bit of posterior inclusion probability on the learning variable and even non-negligible posterior inclusion probability on the advanced variable. So um, probably in the spirit of trying to be fully propagating of the uncertainties involved, probably we should um, try to consider other possible subsets than just working with one variable at a time. So um, we can ask it to repeat the calculation it just made um, by um, 
running a standardized regression, um, and this is often a good thing to do when the predictor variables are on scales that are remarkably different from each other. Um, if you su subtract the mean off of each predictor and divide by its standard deviation, that will create standardized versions of each predictor, which will make the coefficients be, come out on scales that are more comparable. And so what it's done is it just did things over again with, um, with the uh, 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 standardized versions. You'll notice that the posterior inclusion probabilities are identical to what they were before. It's just that now the variables have been listed back in the order 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And the posterior means are now expressed with the standardized scale. So you can get a sense of, of, of relative importance, relative size of the coefficients from, from that. Uh, all right, so what else does it know how to do? Um, you can run a command called summary. And it will tell you about things like how many models did it look at? 2 to the k is 64 here. How many models did it visit? 64. It will work out for you across all the models it looked at what were the mean number of predictor variables in, what, what was the mean number of predictor variables in that, um, that uh, the all, across all those models. And the answer is a little bit bigger than 2 here, suggesting that there is some evidence that we ought to be using more than one variable. And then most of the rest of it is just telling you things you knew already uh, about uh, the structure of the model that was fit. It does report how long it took to do the fitting, which is remarkably quickly, given that it had to fit 64 models. Uh, OK. Um, we can now uh, ask it for something quite interesting, namely, um, find for me, please, the models that have the highest posterior model probability, and sort the, all the models in order from highest posterior model probability to lowest. So you see that uh, it calls the models by names like two, 20 and 28 and 29 and 24. Those are just internal names for um, how that particular model shows up in trying to ex explore all the different sets of, of, of possible subsets of the predictors. Look at model the, the one it calls model 20. Um, it has two ways of calculating the posterior model probability, one it calls exact and one based on MCMC. It didn't actually do any MCMC here, so I think they just dummied out those numbers and made them equal to the exact numbers. But what it's saying is that the model that has only complaints in it has posterior model probability about 29%. But that isn't very high, is it, to just go ahead and throw the other variables away? The model that has both complaints and learning has posterior model probability 0.17. The one that keeps complaints and learning in advance has posterior model probability 0.07. And then they start to fall off after that. But not very quickly, you'll, understand, you'll notice. In fact, Across all 64, if I really wanted to do that, and we would have to stare at all the code, uh, I'm going to go ahead and look at all 64 of them. And uh, um, it's true that a whole bunch of them end up with really, really small posterior model probability, namely numbers like, like the very bottom one that has uh, only critical and advanced in it has posterior model probability 1.5 times 10 to the minus 8. But actually, if you take a look at it, there's um, quite a large number of probabilities or rather of subsets that have posterior model probability bigger than about 0.01, for example. There's, what is that, 6, 2, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. There's 18, 18 different subsets that all have posterior model probability bigger than 1%. And in fact, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, um, 7 models that all have posterior probability bigger than 0.05. Um, the spirit of the Bayesian model averaging idea is to include them all in, 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 in the overall average. And of course, the ones that have posterior probability, something times 10 to the minus 8, will end up not influencing things at all. But the ones that have values like 0.16 and 0.06 will contribute to the mix, along with the other ones that you would have used, like the model 20 that just has the one variable in it. The whole payoff, sorry, do you have a question? They're just trying to give uh, indicator variables for whether the, that variable belongs in the model or not. So it's just an indicator, does that variable, is that variable in that particular model or not? That's all they're trying to say. They could have put a 1 and a 0, but they were going to try to write out the posterior model probabilities to seven significant figures, which is far more than you could actually really support. And given that they did that, in R, you have to write all the numbers above it uh, like that, unless you want to be really anal about how you construct the, the output. So that, that's why it's like that. Um, but there's the whole payoff of this 
is that um, predicting new data values, the predictive distributions for new data values should be more better calibrated than the predictions you get from any single model because they have hedged against the uncertainty about what other variables belong in the model. And in fact, um, you can learn about that with um, this, this, uh, this code. Uh, I'll show you first a very cool picture. This shows across all 64 models which variables appeared the most and with what probability in each model. And so the very first model we looked at with only complaints takes up 29% of the cumulative posterior model probabilities. The next model, which had about 16% or 17% of the probability, picks up both complaints and learning. And in fact, basically what you're seeing from this picture is the farther you go out to pick up as much probability as you want, the complaints variable is always there. And sometimes the learning variable is there. And I don't know why it crossed over and plotted the, uh, these probabilities for advance and privileges in, um, the, in the red color and then going back to the blue color. But basically, what's that? Um, they can't be. Um, this is supposed to show the presence of something that's non-white is supposed to show that that variable belongs in the model. So model three should have had complaints and learning and advance in it. And is that true? Did you see that? Model three had complaints and learning in advance. And so I'm not sure why some of them are, are plotted in a, a sort of a flesh tone and the other ones are blue. In this plot, in this output? Ah, that's probably it. Advance and privileges have negative coefficients. That's a good idea. So they show up and every now and then raises comes in with a negative coefficient too. That's kind of interesting because usually in, in, but of course you know the sign of the coefficient might change according to what other variables are in there. So, okay, thank you for that. Yeah, so these are negative coefficients and these are positive ones. So the overall visual impression here is that um, complaints really belongs in the model, but learning has, has a good chance of helping you improve your predictions as well. Um, this is a plot that shows how much has been learned about how big the model really should be. The prior distribution on how many variables belong in the model um, is a binomial centered at half the number of variables. So each variable has uh, an equal chance of being chosen. So binomially, um, the prior would have an average of three models in it, uh, three, I'm sorry, three predictor variables in it. And you can see these other probabilities. And then they plotted the posterior on top of the prior. And you can see that a fair amount of learning has occurred from the data that we don't need as many, as many variables as are in there when you allow all six of them to come in with equal prior probability. The posterior mode on the number of variables is about two, which again indicates that we might get more predictive accuracy by using the model that included the top two predictors rather than the top one. Um, I can plot the, um, the marginal posterior for any one of the, the variables I'm interested in. So this is the variable complaints, which is the strongest predictor. Um, it's included in the model 99.96% of the time across all the different models that it's looked at. And um, conditional on being in the model, its posterior distribution looks approximately Gaussian with the uncertainty bands that you see right there. I can also plot, um, I can also do um, the following interesting picture or following interesting calculation. I can now uh, predict I can, I can run the code over again, except telling it only to work with the first 21 observations in the data set. And um, that will create a new object called predicted.at&t. And then I can run a function inside the ensemble of functions called pred.density. And what it will do is it will create the predictive distribution for the omitted points. And so I say fit the, the data to the first 21 points. The 30 observations in the data set are completely at random. So fit the data set, fit the model to the first 21 points, and then try to successively predict the remaining nine points in the data set. So now I can run, in fact, I'll run all this code at once and show you the resulting picture. I picked nine because um, I can make the picture in a three by three fashion. And um, on my computer, when I don't have to lose a lot of resolution to get it on the screen, um, these plots looked a little bit better because, and you'll have trouble seeing it now, because I, but I put plotting symbols in. See where my arrow is right now, that black dot in that picture, and there's a black dot over here and a black dot over here. Those are the actual observed values in each case, and the predicted distribution is the blue curve over top of those values. 
So if you can try to pick out the black dots, even though things are very nastily compressed, um, and just make a qualitative impression, does it look as though the actual values that were not part of the fitting process are being reasonably well predicted by this model? Um, the answer would be if the ideal would be if all the dots landed right at their predictive means, that would be terrific. And if if all the dots in the other extreme landed way out in the left or right tails, then we have a very bad predictive model. This one seems to be doing a pretty good job qualitatively. But um, a way to um, measure that quantitatively um, is in, involves an idea that we'll talk about formally uh, either later today or, or next Friday. Namely, um, now we have to face an interesting issue that we haven't talked about before. Um, namely, um, we are able to construct predictive distributions for, for observations, which serve as single points on the number line. So here's a predictive distribution. Let's say it looks sort of Gaussian, maybe a little bit of a long right-hand tail. So this is the predictive distribution for observation 22, given all the rest, given the data from Y1 up to Y21, add the background information. And, um, and in fact, uh, good question, let's see. This, in fact, is the composite predictive distribution across that entire ensemble. So that's good. Suppose the actual data point, Y22, lands right there. How would you think of developing a numerical measure of how discrepant that point is from the, the entire density curve that's trying to, uh, to summarize the predictive information? Well, people have, have come up with a bunch of ad hoc things you could do. For instance, if things did look roughly normal, you could create what you might call predictive z-scores. You could take the number and subtract off, subtract from it its predictive mean and divide by its predictive standard deviation. And you could do that across a bunch of data points and see if those predictive z-scores behave like draws from a standard normal distribution. That would be an ad hoc thing to do. But in fact, this process has a long history. And in fact, the first people, as far as scientists concerned, who were interested in doing it, uh, were weather meteorologists because they all the time, um, as I've, I think I've discussed before, they are to be admired by all of us uniformly because they put their story on the line every single day. Um, they get out there and tell you, um, for instance, the National Weather Service has detailed forecasts about things like minimum and maximum temperatures and barometric pressures and all manner of different things. And then every single day they get to get up the next morning and find out if they were right or not. And so. They've been in the habit for decades now of creating things that behave like, in fact, these days they are using Bayesian methods, predictive distributions for um, observed values and then comparing. They have to be in the business of comparing the observed values with the predictive distributions for them. And so a method for doing that well is called a scoring rule. And people have developed a theory for what uh, constitutes a good scoring rule, and um, they have uh, proven the following interesting fact, that what you ought to do when you're calculating an overall composite measure is for each of these different points, for instance, there might be another predictive distribution over here that looks quite different, and this is the, the actual point, y23, and so on, is you should work, work out the height of the predictive distribution at the actual place where the point landed. Does that make any intuitive sense? Well. Um, if your predictive distribution has a high density near what actually happened, then that's a way of saying that you did a good job in predicting. I think that makes some sense intuitively. Um, and what turns out is that all reasonable scoring rules, according to the criteria that define reasonable scoring rules, are linear functions of what you get by taking the logarithm of that height. So you work out the logarithm of the height of the predictive distribution for y22, given all the other data values. And in fact, you can do that for each of the data points, given, in fact, a simple way to do it, that this software uh, is not set up to do all that readily, would be to compute the logarithm of the height of the predictor for observation i using the whole rest of the data set. Remember, we have this notation y sub minus i to stand for the whole rest of the data set with observation i removed. And this is a jackknifing kind of idea, where you leave one observation out. And then what you're supposed to do, obviously, to get a composite measure across all the data points is either add them up or average them. And so when you read this guy's manual and see what he's actually done, and I can now do that without losing any R code, because that was all the R code I wanted to show you. 
he computes something that's quite close to what I'm interested in, but not exactly the same. Uh, I need to go back over here, don't I? Um, he computes the sum. I'm in the habit of computing the average. And he computes minus the sum. And in fact, I don't mind the minus sign. Uh, for him, uh, you can tell uh, if we don't put the minus sign in there, if I cover that up, then um, I do a better job um, the bigger that sum is, right? Because I want the height of the predictive to be big, and the logarithm is a monotone increasing function, and so I want the logarithm of the height to be big, and adding that up across all the data, I want that sum to be big. Therefore, I want minus that sum to be small. So these other people, uh, like uh, Fernandez and other people, they prefer this log predictive score, which involves summing the numbers and working, just putting the minus sign in there. I actually prefer um, to work with the plus sign and to average them, but it's, it's going to be, uh, they're going to be linearly related to each other. Um, this thing here that I've written down here um, is called, uh, the, in, the, in the technology that I use, it's called the cross-validation log score. And I shouldn't have said this is across the model class. This is across a particular model. Actually, these predictive distributions are from, uh, oh, they're from the Bayesian model average model. That's right. Okay, so. Um, so it evaluates that particular model or model class given the data vector y and the background information. And this provides what I view as one of the most valuable criteria uh, to use for comparing one model with another. Basically, what we want to do is find, find model m to make this log score big. Now, this is actually a bit of a pain to leave one out each observation, because you have to create separate predictive distributions each time with different data sets. And so my, my student, Milovan, uh, from Serbia, Milovan Kurnjajic and I, we said to ourselves, well, let's go ahead and just calculate something. We're going to call it the full sample log score for a particular model, given the data in the background. And we're going to do the same thing, except we're going to go log of p of yi, given the entire data vector y, and the, and the background information of that particular model. Full sample because we're using the full sample over here on the right of the conditioning bar. Now, right away you can see that's not quite right because we have yi appearing in the left-hand side and also on the right-hand side. In other words, we're using yi to help predict yi. But if little n is even moderately large, uh, it turns out that that effect is quite small. And moreover, a very surprising thing happened in our simulation work. We found that actually the full sample log score version produced better model discrimination properties than the cross-validation version did, which was a little bit like Christmas coming early. We had done the full sample log score just as a way to make computations faster, and we were interested to see how much model discrimination accuracy we lost. And actually, we found that it was faster and did a better job in small samples. And obviously, in large samples, they're going to be equivalent, because um, with little n equals 100 or 200, it hardly matters at all whether you leave one point out or not in this overall story. So later on. Uh, today, perhaps, if we have time, but certainly next uh, Friday, we're going to talk quite a bit about the log score criterion. And I'll show you how to compute it using output from WinBugs or RJAGs. And um, then uh, we can begin the process of comparing one model with another based upon that. So I didn't have time today to get in getting ready for this tutorial. Yes? What's that? Um, I'm going to wave my hands about that. It just turns out that the theorem is that all good scoring rules are linear functions of not the height of the density, but the log of the height. Um, and that actually relates to this idea of callback leibler divergence between one distribution and another. And I'm going to postpone that till next time as well. So that just has to be a mystery for us right this moment. Um, I can bring a book next time and show you the theorem and the proof that shows where that comes from. But uh, you get better scoring in terms of finding the right model when, when you know what the right model is by working with the logarithm of those heights than by working with the heights themselves. Of course, there's lots of different functions. We could talk about the height squared or the reciprocal of the height or all sorts of different functions. And people have shown that the logarithm is, is the best thing to do or some linear function of it. Um, OK, so uh, let's return now to the main line over here. So I've now shown you um, the. Uh, story with respect to Bayesian model averaging in a simple example, namely the one involving, yes, please, oh, thank you, in linear regression. Um, and the last thing I should have shown you was I should have compared this number down here with the number you get by working only with the model, just with the, that one predictor that we thought was better. 
and I have not finished those calculations yet. I'll bring them to you for next time. But I predict what we'll find is that on this log score criterion, the model average story has a better predictive performance than the model that's based only on that one predictive variable itself. That's what we often find when we do Bayesian model averaging. It shows up as producing better calibrated predictive distributions, and that means that we're doing a better job of capturing how much uncertainty we have in the model and propagating it. A reminder, we didn't propagate uncertainty about all aspects of the model. I didn't bring in uncertainty about whether interaction should be present or whether the error term should be Gaussian or something else, but we've We've actually worked carefully and rather quickly at a, at a substantial component of uncertainty in regression modeling, namely what subset of the predictors is, is the best subset to use. Uh huh. What's that? This number here? Oh, how does it scale in computation? Um, it's, uh, it doesn't scale so great in terms of full enumeration. Uh, let's try some examples. Um, yes, that's going to add. Um, if we've got six variables, it's going to add six times six over two, so about another 18 uh, terms in the model. Um, and then um, we have to look at models. Uh, instead of only having six predictors, there's now 24 predictors. So let's look at that. Two to the sixth is 64. Two to the 24th is on the order of about 16 million models. That's actually within decent computation speed uh, on, a, on a decent laptop these days. He, his program can actually do full enumeration across to the 24th models in a couple hours. Um, so if you wanted to do that. Um, but uh, you know, the, you, you've know you seen what happens, right? So 2 to the 40th, if you've got 40 predictors to choose from, we're now up around time, uh, 10 to the 12th. Um, 2 to the 100th is a number that you don't even want to talk about, um, 10 to the 30th. And so with these bigger numbers, when full enumeration is not possible, as I mentioned in passing a little while ago, his program does uses Markov chain Monte Carlo to do stochastic search in the space of all uh, subsets of predictors, and it tries to visit the models that are uh, that have the highest posterior probability more often, and and therefore thereby, in any fixed amount of CPU time, give you a good idea of what some of the good subsets are. No one in this literature is able to guarantee you that you always get the best subsets when the set of all possible subsets is too large, because full enumeration is impossible. You can't do them all and rank them in that way. In fact, in, in fact, that's what, in fact, a hybrid strategy like that is what um, uh, another one of my students, a Greek called Dimitris Fuskakis, and I have been doing. Um, what we do in a really big space is we uh, initially run um, the, let's see, how does this go? We make a run with. Um, all possible predictors in the model for um, a period of time that's long enough to get a sense of what's going on, but not so long that it's really holding back the analysis. So we might run the MCMC algorithm for six hours or 12 hours overnight, for example, for a day. And then we harvest what look like the most promising predictor variables from those models by looking at the posterior inclusion probabilities. And then we throw all the other variables away, and we go back and we make uh, much more intensive MCMC run on the reduced set of variables. So we have an example in one of our papers where there are something like 54 covariates. And by the first initial search, we were able to reduce from 54 down to about 16. And 2 to the 16th is pretty small. So we can actually get around, around that model space pretty quickly. So yes, you're right. Um, it brings in the possibility of doing some kind of adaptive strategies in which you do an initial run and toss some variables away, and then, then do a full run on the rest. OK, so, um, so I've now shown you a little bit about Bayesian model averaging. Um, I want to show you next time what the results are comparing that particular model averaged answer with the, aver the answer from that single model. And I also want to show you what happens when you run Adrian Raftery's software on the same data set, because he uses different ways of approximating the posterior model probabilities and he uses different priors on the model parameters. And so um, this is an, uh, a topic of um, uh, substantial um, still confusion. I wouldn't, confusion is too strong a word, but there's, people are still publishing good papers every, every few months on how to do this problem. Um, so there's the, the set of possible ways to do it is still being explored. Now, a second approach, which we're going to look at in detail next time, 
um, is called Bayesian nonparametric modeling. And so if you look at that integral in equation five here, um, it's in effect, it, you can think of it as an approximation to the unattainable ideal of averaging over all worthwhile models. Here in this integral in, in equation five, it only averages over the models in your ensemble um, script M. But um, in what you'd really like to average over is a much bigger ensemble that includes, in some sense, all worthwhile models if you knew what they were and how to find them, but we don't. And so you can regard uh, the Bayesian model averaging approach as a kind of approximation to integrating over a much bigger model space. And that's what Bayesian nonparametrics tries to do. So um, I've told you already the initial version of uh, this story. Let me see what I, what I wrote. Yeah. OK, good. So let's continue that example from Kaiser that I started earlier today. Um, and suppose in addition to observing for each of those 112 people uh, not only whether or not they had an unplanned transfer to the intensive care unit, I also measure a real value conceptually continuous quality of care score, Y sub I. And now before I've got any of the data values, I'm thinking about my predictive distribution for those continuous quantities um, uh, given the background information. And uh, as before, we will notice that um, within the absence of any covariates, um, our predictive distribution for those quality of care scores is still exchangeable. And so he then went on to prove a generalization of his earlier representation theorem for dichotomous outcomes, which is now a representation theorem for continuous outcomes. And it says the following thing. If you are prepared to extend your judgment of exchangeability from y1 to y little n, which is the data you have, to y1 to, to capital N, which is a much bigger number, and here we should be able to extend it all the way to um, capital N here because the 112 people are so chosen at random from that bigger universe. And if capital N is a lot bigger than little n, which is certainly true here, 8,561 given versus 112, then you can show that all logically internally consistent predictive distributions have to be expressible hierarchically like this. Um, if you could have done a complete census of the entire population values, all 8,500 and blah, blah of them, um, then you could create a cumulative distribution function from those values. Um, and that, that thing we're going to call capital F. Um, and you probably remember how to, comp how to create a, an empirical cumulative distribution function. Or maybe if you don't, I can, uh, I can remind you. Um, all the empirical cumulative distribution function does, empirical CDF, all it does is it simply locates where the points are. And it just adds up how much of the mass is, is at that point or to the left of it. So suppose the data values occur there. And then there's two of them right there. And then the last one is right there. Um, thank you. So what the, um, and let's say this is 1.2, and this is 1.7, and this is uh, 2.4, for example. Um, then what the empirical CDF will do um, is up until you get this point here, there hasn't been any data yet, and so it's zero. And then we're going to have four points, so we're going to go a quarter, a half, three quarters, and 1.0. So a quarter, a half, three fourths, and one. Um, and at 1.2, it says, well, look, I found a quarter of the data so far, so it jumps up to a quarter. And then it continues to sweep to the right, and it doesn't notice any new data yet for a while, so it stays right there. And then it notices there's two new points. And so right at 1.7, it jumps all the way up to 3 quarters. And then it stays there. And right at 2.4, it jumps finally up to 1.0, and it stays there the rest of the way. So that's the empirical CDF of the following data set that consists of 1.2, 1.7, 1 1.7, and 2.4. And it can be written Fn hat of um, t, let's say. And all it represents is the number of the yi values that are less than or equal to t divided by n. That's all it's really doing. And you can also write that as an average of a bunch of indicator functions. You work out the indicator of whether y is less than or equal to t as a function of t, and you add that up. And that gives you the empirical CDF. So what we're imagining now is if you could dump out all the population numbers and um, make an empirical CDF of those numbers, we're going to call that thing capital F. And Definetti says, your model has to be, if you knew what capital F was, and going along with the background information, then the YIs would be IID from capital F. 
But then you have to be prepared, like any good Bayesian, to express the fact that you don't know what capital F is, and so you have to be able to put a prior distribution on the capital F, which involves placing a prior distribution on a much richer space than we've ever talked about before. We know how to put prior distributions on numbers. Our first example was the Bernoulli case study with the heart attack people, and we worked out how to put prior distributions on a number that lives between 0 and 1. Okay, we learned how to do that. Then we talked about placing prior distributions on numbers that live on the whole positive part of the real line and then on the entire real line. And we have not had occasion yet to place prior distributions very much on vectors, although I think we did that a little bit in the, the Gaussian model with both parameters unknown. Um, and um, the next step up from that would be trying to place a prior on a matrix, and there's a technology for doing that in some cases. Particularly, you find it important and necessary in the Bayesian story to place prior distributions on covariance matrices or correlation matrices. So there's a technology for doing that. Um, but now, imagine trying to place a prior distribution on a, a function. And in fact, this empirical CDF, you know CDFs, all they have to, the only properties they have to satisfy is that they are one eventually at plus infinity and they're zero back there at minus infinity and they can never go down. They're always monotonically non-decreasing. They might have flat spots like this one does here, but they never go down. So imagine thinking of the set of all functions that has that behavior. That's an enormously big set, but people have now worked out how to do that. Um, we now know how to place priors on, on entire distribution functions, and therefore, in effect, priors also on density functions in a way that's both technically feasible and scientifically meaningful. We can actually figure out how to tune those priors to behave the way we want them to. When De Finetti proved the theorem in 1937, he did not have the faintest idea how to do this. Um, but he knew that it was the right thing that you had to do because that's what his theorem said. And we had to wait decades after that until people began making progress on this issue. Um, the first per person that worked on it was David Friedman in the 1960s, then Tom Ferguson in the 1970s, then Michael Levine uh, in the 19. 80s, then Escobar and West in the 1990s. Um, and Escobar and West were the first people who showed how to use Markov chain Monte Carlo to, to completely some, uh, simulate from the posterior that we're interested in here and anything, everything else that's related to it. And by the end of all this work so far, we have two methods for doing this sensibly. We have the method called polytrees, and we have a method called Dirichlet process priors, or DP priors for short. It turns out that DP priors are a special case of polytrees, but they're different enough that people give them two separate names. And these are both now in pretty routine use. There's a whole subfield called Bayesian nonparametric distributions, or rather Bayesian nonparametric modeling, which is just the pro process of placing distributions on functions rather than on, on numbers or vectors or matrices. And that particular Bayesian nonparametric um, uh, field has two basic subcomponents. What would be some examples of some functions that you'd want to know? Well, one of them is CDFs. And so uh, imagine a distribution that could place itself on top of entire functions that behave like CDFs. So here's 0 and here's 1. Every time you take a point at random from that distribution, you get out an entire curve. Imagine that, an entire CDF curve. So choose another point from this distribution, and you get another curve. Maybe this one looks like that, and so on. And uh, it turns out that there are ways to um, to govern the behavior of these curves as a function of things that you want to put in as inputs. So this is BNP on CDFs. And here's another version of BNP on functions. Suppose I were interested in predicting a y from an x, and the scatter plot showed some strange nonlinear sort of thing going on. Um, why wouldn't I be interested in um, a, a rather general way of trying to work out uh, a function that captured the basic trend of the points in y as far as x was concerned? So look, your uncertainty about that, that curve is uncertainty about another function, but it's a whole different function. It's just any curve that represents how you would try to regress y on x, and so that's quite different. So this becomes Bayesian nonparametrics on uh, regression surfaces. And over here, we get methods like polytrees and those DP priors I mentioned a minute ago. We'll look at both of them next week. 
And over here you get uh, a class of techniques called Gaussian processes. and things that are generalizations of them. So I'm not going to talk about Gaussian processes this quarter. I don't have enough experience in them to be able to speak intelligently on that topic. But I do. I have written papers on Bayesian nonparametrics on CDFs. And I can help you um, visualize what's going on there. And we'll do some data examples as well. Um, OK, so um, returning to the in-home geriatric as assessment example. Um, and I need to switch. Thank you. We're once again. Um, visualizing that data set as a table shell, essentially the underlying CDF of the control counts is something that we don't know. And we'd like to treat it non-parametrically if we could. And the underlying CDF of the treatment numbers is another thing that we'd like to treat non-parametrically as a CDF. So is there a way to do that? Well, um, letting, as before, mu c and mu t be the mean hospitalization rates per two years in the population script P of all elderly non-institutionalized people in Denmark in that period in the early 80s under the control and treatment conditions respectively. The inferential quantity of main interest here is still theta, which is that difference, relative difference, mu t minus mu c over mu c. Or of course, we could redefine this without loss as just mu t over mu c because theta is just mu t over mu c minus 1. So now the question becomes, how can you draw valid and accurate inferences about theta while coping with your uncertainty about those underlying CDFs in the control and treatment? We could call them capital F sub C and capital F sub T. Um, essentially, uh, you remember we talked earlier about the idea of what some people call nuisance parameters. There's parameters you care about, and then there's all the other parameters that are floating around that help you understand the parameter you care about. In effect, F sub C and F sub T are like nuisance parameters here. They represent um, something we would really like to know to be able to get at theta, but they don't represent the heart of theta itself. We would really like to know theta. <clears throat> and so it's as though these counts at the bottom of the page here act like nuisance parameters, and we're trying to estimate them in a way that um, fully propagates our, our uncertainty about what the underlying story is in the data generating mechanism. Well, one approach that I'll show you next time, uh, I've been calling Bayesian qualitative quantitative inference. It turns out that the exchangeability judgments that are inherent in this data set and this um, particular experiment imply a multinomial sampling distribution on the uh, qualitative outcome variable that has category labels 0, 1, and so on. And then it turns out you can actually do the thing I said before. You can actually do optimal Bayesian model specification in a way that does not make any assumptions that are not driven directly from the context of the problem. Another approach is with Bayesian nonparametric modeling. And, uh, my student, uh, Milovan Kurnjajic, and my colleague, Thanasis Kotas, and I uh, wrote a paper about this. Um, you, can, um, you can put uh, Dirichlet process priors, one on F sub C and another one on F sub T. And again, I'll show you how to do this next week. Um, and uh, it turns out that, um, that as a side effect of the DP process that is undesirable in some cases, but actually works quite well here, uh, DP priors turn out to put all their mass on discrete distributions. Um, and that's no problem for us because, look, we have discrete distributions in both the control and the treatment groups. So we could just put parallel DP priors on each of those CDFs. And we show in that paper how to do it and what we get for the results. Um, in general, for continuous modeling, it sounds like the DP story isn't any good, right? Because if every time you make a draw from a DP prior, out comes a discrete distribution. And yet you're trying to model something that you think of as continuous, then that sounds like a bad thing. But actually, we know what to do about that. We're statisticians here. Whenever we have a way to do something that's discrete, we can simply take mixtures of discrete things and make them as close to continuous as you possibly want. So what people really do, do is not DP modeling, but DP mixture modeling, because the mixing process makes, makes the result close to continuous. Um, and so here I showed you, I've already shown you these data values. Um, and we already did the parametric analysis, so we can skip over this particular slide. Um, and as we know, we have no covariates to help explain the extra Poisson variability. Um, and so we end up with the random effects Poisson regression model um, in the bottom of page 38, which here I'm calling equation 6. In fact, um, we could call model 1. In fact, you remember we did this. On bottom of page 37, model 1 is just parallel Poisson, um, uh, ran, uh, uh, rather fixed effects models in the control and treatment group separately. Let's call that model 1. That wasn't very good. Then model 2. Uh, we could instead fit parallel negative binomial models, because that's one way to describe the overdispersion. 
But in fact, Model 3 is a better model um, for where we're headed right now. So you remember Model 3 is just exactly what we did um, last time. It says, if you knew what lambda i was, and if you were operating under Model 3, and if you assumed the background information, then the way you would simulate a yi was to make independent draws from Poisson distributions where everybody has their own lambda i. Then the next line is the regression line. Log lambda i is related in a linear regression fashion to the covariate for whether you're in control or treatment, plus a random effect ei. Then the third line of the model says, well, the epsilon i's, I'll call it epsilon here, the epsilon i's given uh, sigma squared epsilon and model 3 and the background information. We took them to be IID normal draws with a mean of 0 and variant sigma squared epsilon. And then finally, there's, there's um, uh, parameters floating around in this whole story, gamma 0, gamma 1, and sigma squared epsilon. Again, given model 3 and uh, the background information, we would take those as diffuse. So that's a, that's a nice parametric model that turned out to fit that in-home geriatric assessment data really well. But if we were trying to be more careful about it, um, we would want to try to relax some of the parametric assumptions that are hidden inside this story. So where are they? Well, there's a Poisson assumption on the first line. I am reluctant to give that up because a model in which the counts on how many people, you know, how many hospitalizations a person got, where everybody gets their own lambda, that actually, Poisson is a really good model for that if everybody's allowed to have their own lambda. That really is how the world is because it's a model for um, uh, a count of relatively rare events. But look at this normal distribution down here, right there, the n right there about the epsilons. Um, we don't really know that. We only assumed it in model 3 just because it provided a, a, a nice, simple distribution that we could base our inferences on. Um, and so the Bayesian nonparametric idea would be to say, you don't really know those are Gaussian. Why not place a prior distribution on the cumulative distribution function of the epsilons that allows you to express your uncertainty about that quantity? Then you're being more honest from a, from a model uncertainty point of view. Instead of sticking in an assumption that you don't know is true, and by the way, is pretty close to untestable in the actual data, why not try to be more honest about what you do and don't know by putting a nonparametric prior right there? Well, in this model, we know the unknown domain policy interest is that theta quantity, which is um, e to the gamma 1. And the other parameters can all be collected into a vector. And the random effect can be thought of, as I showed you before, proxying for those combined main effects of all the other variables that we forgot to measure. Now, as I've said here on page 39, I just said a second ago, the first line of 6, that previous model, makes good scientific sense, because the yi's are counts of relatively rare events. But the Gaussian assumption on that fourth line um, was, or the third line, I guess, in the previous model, was not something that was driven by the science of the problem. And you remember always my goal, my, my holy grail in model specification, is to try to condition on only things, only on things that are driven directly by the data gathering process and the structure of the problem you're working on. So instead of jumping in there and writing down a normal distribution that we don't know is right, a better idea would be to put a prior distribution on that CDF. And it turns out that the Bayesian nonparametric story is very cool you can center that prior distribution at the normal curve. In other words, you can teach the data gathering process that it should start in figuring out what's really going on. It should start at the normal and then move away from the normal if the data don't really have the normal character. So it's actually pretty cool. It's a way to adaptively learn about the underlying CDF of the process that you're trying to study in a way so that you start the process over uh, off at a prior distribution like a normal, but then if the data are saying, no, not normal, bimodal, what will happen in the posterior is that the weight will shift away from the normal toward something that looks more like a mixture of two normals, for instance, or whatever the bimodal story might be. So the Bayesian nonparametric story um, has a great virtue in that it is, in theory, adaptable to whatever data generating mechanism is really going on with enough data it will shift the prior mass, it will shift the posterior mass away from the prior story and move it toward what's really going on in the data. And so that's quite cool. No matter what the model is, the Bayesian nonparametric process can learn the model, which is very cool. And so um, an expansion of the previous model uh, that involves the nonparametric idea is this equation 7 down at the bottom of page 39. It says, first two lines are identical. Third line says, if I knew what capital F was, the epsilon i's would be IID from F. 
And then the fourth line says the F is like a draw from one of these Dirichlet process priors, and I'll explain to you what that means um, uh, mostly next time. And then there's a bunch of parameters floating around, including some new ones, and so we put some, prior, some priors on those diffuse priors on those parameters. What's going on in the DP is that um, every prior that I've shown you this quarter, although we didn't always write them this way, can be expressed involving two inputs. One of them is a prior guess or estimate for the thing you're trying to put the prior on, and the other is a number that plays the role of a prior sample size. It tells you how concentrated the prior should be around the prior estimate. But look in this expression here, dp of alpha comma f0, that's exactly what the dp tries to do. f0 is the centering distribution, oops, and alpha governs how much prior mass you put on that centering distribution. The bigger the alpha value, the more the posterior will concentrate on the normal distribution because you're saying, I actually have a lot of confidence scientifically that things really are normal. The smaller the alpha value, the more the DP process will try to learn what the data is really saying rather than sticking so closely to the normal story. So there is actually quite a natural narrative involving complicated mathematics that we don't have to go into here, but it's now been propagated down to a functional level where there's R functions to do this stuff. And so I'll show you how to do Bayesian nonparametrics using R functions. And one of my friends uh, who does Bayesian nonparametrics wrote a WinBugs program even. You can do Bayesian nonparametrics in WinBugs also. So um, that finishes our work for today. Uh, we went, we started today by going way up to the um, 30,000 feet above uh, ground level view of things. And now we're probably back down in the trees, right? Because we're down in these little teeny details of how to do these nonparametric priors and so on. I hope all will become clearer next week when I show you actually how to do it and we can start seeing what, what happens. So next time we will meet uh, in this same place for week eight and also week nine and week 10 are here as well. And thanks for coming again. Um, if you have any questions about the material as usual, please write to me uh, in the week between now and next Friday and I'll do my best to, to help out.